Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. The efficacy, the protection against disease is extraordinarily high. It's 95% against symptomatic COVID. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It really does work. But as more Americans receive the COVID-19 vaccine, will it still be effective against the new variants entering the U.S.? Even in the face of these variants, the vaccines have been extraordinarily effective against the more severe spectrum of disease. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. It is Monday, February the 15th, 2021. And while the logistics are still a significant challenge, the vaccine rollout in the United States is really picking up speed. The CDC estimated yesterday that 38 million Americans have had at least one dose of vaccine and over 14 million Americans are fully vaccinated. So that's some progress. Here to talk about this today is one of our favorite experts, Dr. Greg Poland from the Mayo Clinic. Hi, Greg. Good morning, Helene. I'm pretty sure you're wearing red because I forgot to send my co-host a Valentine's Day greeting. <laughs> well, Greg, I might be wearing my red because you forgot to give me a Valentine this year. I hope you remember to give your wife a Valentine, however. Yes, ma'am. Good. <laughs> but I noticed today that you have a great tie on that really um, applies to your field of science. Would you show yeah, see, that to us? Yeah, leave it to another physician to have sharp eyes like that. This is a tie of all different kinds of viruses. And I sort of wore it uh, in, in uh, celebration of the fact that we are actually getting a handle on this virus in the United States. So <laughs> I think that officially classifies us as nerds, Greg. Wearing so. a virus tie and recognizing <laughs> it. That's awesome. Well, good to see you today, Greg. And you. Are you, are you staying warm? Well, it is really frigid in Minnesota. It's like uh, almost 20 below zero. And so, and no um, hope in sight for the next couple of days, but well, we're gonna warm know, up after that. And, and that weather is important because that's affecting so many of us across a broad path of the US. And when we're in cold weather and enclosed, that's a risk yeah, for certainly. transmission of COVID. So we really have to be, you know, redouble our efforts, which are working. I mean, we've got good news to share here. Well, tell the, us some good news, Greg. I mean, we the, we are down, sun, as of Sunday, we had 64,000 new cases. Now, I mean, that's still a lot, but remember that we were peaking at 300,000 new cases a day. Wow. We were getting up to three, 4,000 deaths a day. We're right at about 1,000 deaths. So people are are getting it. And I think in the in the face of what we've seen, they are masking, they are distancing, and it's working as well as getting so many vaccines out there. Let's just be careful to maintain that during this you know, cold time when we're indoors. That's a great reminder, but it is good to hear some good news today, Greg. We're talking about vaccine rollout um, at the beginning, so let me just ask you, do you think, Greg, that um, all Americans are going to have a chance to get vaccinated by spring or summer? I think that is definitely true for adults above the age of 16 to 18 years old. Um, so I do think that is a, a, a reality, not just a hope. I think that is a reality. Um, what I'm hoping is that before school starts in the fall, we'll have data so that older kids at least will also have an opportunity to get the vaccine. So uh, that one still depends on uh, studies that have uh, been actually enrolled now and data has to be analyzed. Uh, and I think that will happen too. That's great. Last week, Greg, we shared our uh, email address here at uh, Mayo Clinic Q&A and the News Network. And we've had some questions. One of the most common questions that we're receiving is questions about what is a normal reaction to the vaccine? How do I know if my reaction is normal? And how do I know what to do about it? You know, this is a really good question. I get lots of these questions from my patients. So let me just say this. The vaccines are reactogenic. What that means is that they are inducing a high level of antibody response, and that's a good thing. But if you will, sort of the price to pay for such a good immune response is that we get local and systemic side effects. Those can be small rashes on the arm. They can be fevers, fatigue, headache, muscle and joint aches. 
by the second dose, you're talking about 60 to 80 percent of adults experience some level of that. I had pretty moderate symptoms after my second dose of vaccine, but they're self-limited. They last usually under 24 to 36 hours. Uh, I took one dose of Tylenol to control low-grade fever, and the next day I was back to normal. So uh, I, I don't want people to think that uh, having fever, having any of the sort of symptoms that I mentioned means that anything's going wrong. It doesn't. It means your body is developing a very vigorous response to that spike protein that you're being given. And in turn, that will protect you. And that's why we see such extraordinary high efficacy of these vaccines. Greg, I had absolutely no response to, to either, no reaction, um, except maybe a little bit of a sore arm with the second one. Um, does that mean anything in terms of my immune response? And have you noticed a trend toward higher um, reactivity or side effects in younger individuals, or is that just kind of a myth that's out there? No, you're, you're right, Helena. That, that is true. That was seen in the, in the phase three clinical trials. Uh, adults over the age of 60, 65 tend to have less in the way of those side effects compared to younger people. Well, now, I'm not 65 yet, Greg. No, you're not. You're definitely not. <laughs> Let me just say that publicly. <laughs> um, in regards to the question of whether the severity of side effects um, in, in any way predicts your measured antibody amount, we don't have any data to say that. So in other words, the fact that you had minimal symptoms and I had moderate symptoms doesn't mean that you didn't respond with equally as protective antibody levels. How do you know the difference between what is an immune response, which is what we want, and what is an allergic response? Yeah, that's really key. And anybody going to get a vaccine, anybody giving a vaccine, should at least have a basic knowledge of that. An allergic response almost always has skin manifestations and associated symptoms like uh, swelling of a lip, swelling of your throat so that there's difficulty breathing, a drop in blood pressure. Those would be the sorts of things that we would be concerned uh, are indicating an allergic reaction. Now, there's dangerous allergic reactions and there's non-dangerous. A rash at the site, a little bit of itching, that's not a contraindication to getting a second dose. Difficulty breathing, on the other hand, a true anaphylactic reaction is an absolute contraindication to getting another dose of the vaccine. So we, we do want to distinguish those. And those are distinguished in turn from the things I've mentioned a sore arm, a swollen arm, a minor rash at the injection site, headache, fever, shaking chills. I had, I had a few hours of shaking chills. That is not evidence of anything going wrong. And for reasons we don't quite understand, those uh, side effects can be different in different people. My body just reacts differently than, than yours did, but it doesn't mean that one is more or less protected than the other. So Greg, speaking of reactions, if you will just clarify for us, um, it has been noted, and you have commented on this yourself, that the second dose of vaccine often um, promotes more of a reaction or side effect afterward. Are we getting something different in the second dose, or why do we react differently? Yeah, you're getting the exact same vaccine. In fact, right now, the recommendation is to not interchange vaccines. I've tried to think of a, an analogy for it. When you give the first dose of vaccine, as, it's as if you've started that cold car. The car's now idling. You give that second dose, the car's warmed up, and you can put the pedal to the metal and go, you know, 60 miles per hour in, a, in just a few seconds, which you wouldn't have been able to do without that car started and, and idling. So again, it is not an indication of anything going wrong. It's an indication that your body now recognizes, is revved up, prepared to do battle against what it thinks is a foreign invader, this spike protein. When it sees that protein, 
your body is now trained to think, oh, it's the whole virus, it's dangerous. And it starts releasing chemicals that tell other immune cells, come over here to this arm, do battle here. And those are what the side effects are that we experience. They're not dangerous. They're not something that persists. They go away generally with minimal or no treatment. Greg, how do you explain those of us like myself who didn't have a response like that? So you did have a response. What you didn't have is the same level of innate immune response. And I'm getting down into the weeds a little bit, but each of our bodies releases different amounts of chemicals. What my body did is released more than what it needed. What your body did, Helena, is match what you needed to the vaccine. So you're just as protected. The data show that. You just didn't suffer those, those side effects. So, you know, some of us, the, the car gets revved up higher than it needs to be. It's not dangerous. And others of us, it gets revved up to just the right amount, what we have actually called the Goldilocks phenomena. Not too much, not too little, but just right. Just right. That's good, Greg. I just needed that reassurance that I was okay. You're fine. Greg, we have a listener who would like to know if they did have a mild reaction in their arms, such as maybe a little rash or soreness or something like that, does it matter if you have the second vaccine in the same arm or should you switch arms? Yeah, it really shouldn't matter which arm you get it in. Now, many people do switch arms because they're, depending on which vaccine you get, three to four weeks apart and they don't want to have a sore arm in the arm that was just sore two or three weeks ago. So there's no problem with doing that, but nor is there any data that would tell us one is better than the other. I, I would say that maybe something to think about is that with your second dose, maybe you want to get it in your non-dominant arm because you're likely to have more soreness or local reactivity with the second dose. So you'd like to have your dominant arm free to you know, do your activities of daily living. Greg, we've had many, many questions about this, about having antibody tests after having a vaccine. Are antibody tests needed after a vaccine? Uh, when would you need to do them? What are the current recommendations? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, good, good practical question, uh, Helena. You know, there really is no uh, regular or standard indication to, to do antibody testing. That represents an additional demand on the healthcare system at a time when we're deploying people to try to give vaccines and try to do you know, just regular contact testing, uh, et cetera. So there's no need to do any sort of antibody testing. There might be rare exceptions to that. For example, you could think of a situation maybe where somebody uh, had gotten an organ transplant and uh, could not avoid going into perhaps some sort of risky situation, maybe something unusual like that but under normal circumstances, there is no need. Now, why would I say that? Because when you look at the clinical trials and they enrolled a wide diversity of age, race, gender, comorbidities, uh, et cetera, the efficacy, the protection against disease is extraordinarily high. It's 95% against symptomatic COVID, essentially 100% against hospitalization and death. So the cost and the effort is, is just not justified. And at the current time, there's no recommendation to do that. So I have a follow-up question on that. I think I mentioned at least a month ago that I was involved in this vitamin study here at Mayo Clinic, zinc specifically, um, and whether that would, um, people who took zinc would have less um, opportunity or, or convert or have antibodies to COVID or develop the, the illness. Now, I had been told originally that once I got both of my vaccines, I would need to um, be um, de-enrolled from the study because I would have formed antibodies. But there must be different types of antibodies that you can test for because I've now been told that no, it would be a different antibody that you would have after having a vaccine than what they test for. So how would anyone know what antibodies to ask for anyway? Yeah, well, you're, you're very right. And that can be a little bit confusing. So 
the two mRNA vaccines that are uh, under EUA, the third one, Johnson & Johnson, which will probably come toward the end of the month, all three of those vaccines are only giving one portion of the virus called the S or spike protein. When you're infected with the actual wild virus, yes, you would have S antibody, but also antibodies against the other parts of the virus. For example, the nucleocapsid, the N protein, and that's what's standardly tested. So N protein antibody indicates you've been infected. S antibody alone means either you were infected in the past or got vaccine. Okay, so if you if someone had wanted an antibody to show that they were um, that they had received vaccine, they wouldn't want the same antibody drawn necessarily exactly that right. you would to test. Exactly right. We would okay. just do S antibody. Whereas if we were concerned that you had gotten infected, we would measure N antibody. Interesting. We always learn so much, Greg. <laughs> Greg, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the variants or strains. Um, there are specific questions about the South African uh, variant and what we know about that, and particularly as it relates to the vaccines that are being used. Yeah, you know, this is, this is an area of ongoing research and investigation. What we have now are vaccines from AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, where there were um, trials in countries where we could look at the Brazilian, so-called Brazilian variant, the so-called UK variant, the so-called South African variant. And what we can say is that they are less effective, not by very much, but a little bit less effective in preventing mild and even up to moderate infection. They remain very effective in preventing severe infection and again, close to 100% in preventing hospitalization and death, even due to those variants. Now, we need to gather more and more information. And as you've pointed out before, Helena, this is a moving target, right? They're going to continue to mutate. Even the variants that we have may well have additional variations on that theme. So it's something we're going to have to continue to watch. In preparation for that. We don't know if it will be needed, but in preparation for that, a number of manufacturers are making a booster vaccine against particularly the South African variant, or in the case of Johnson & Johnson, looking at what would two doses do as opposed to just one dose. But again, you know, the, the variants are a reason to be as strict as we can about proper masking and distancing, but I really want to uh, reassure our, our listeners and viewers, even in the face of these variants, the vaccines have been extraordinarily effective against the more severe spectrum of disease. That doesn't mean you couldn't have moderate or even mild or even transmit it to somebody else if you got infected, but you're not going to end up in the hospital and you're not going to die. This weekend, uh, Greg, we were visiting with um, my husband's son and his wife, and uh, she's had a question that multiple of our um, listeners have had. If a woman becomes pregnant, is it okay for her to receive a vaccine? Which vaccine? And uh, how about breastfeeding mothers as well? So the, the latter one is easy. No contraindication whatsoever in breastfeeding. Um, the, 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 the only likelihood that could happen is that antibody would get into the breast milk and protect the baby. So not worried at all, zero concern about breastfeeding. Now pregnancy. Um, so some of the manufacturers are now doing a clinical trial in, I think they're enrolling about 2,000 uh, pregnant women. We don't have those results yet. What we do have is in the phase three clinical trials, there were a number of women who who were pregnant and didn't know it at the time that they were immunized. We have not seen any increased risk of spontaneous miscarriage or premature delivery or anything like that. Um, what we don't know, because the numbers are small, is are there any other side effects? Well, you have to balance that. So the answer is no. We have not yet seen anything 
uh, adverse happening in a pregnant woman with vaccines. You have to balance that against not getting a vaccine. So some data just came out. Um, if you look at women of the same age and you look at non-pregnant women versus pregnant women, those women had a risk of about 2.8% of getting hospitalized from COVID. In the pregnant women, it was about 10%. So about three and a half fold um, um, higher. In addition, the uh, risk of death in a pregnant woman was about 13.5% fold higher wow. in pregnant women that got COVID. So, you know, we're balancing that against some data indicating safety with the vaccine in pregnant women, but not as much as we would like to have. So what to do? I, I really think that this is one of those places where um, the tilt would be toward getting the vaccine, given the data that I just uh, shared with you. But my personal practice and what I'm doing a lot of, because as you might imagine, I get a lot of calls and emails about it, is to talk to the woman and find out what they're doing. If it's an ER nurse, get the vaccine, right? You're at high risk. You're a school teacher, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. If you're somebody that says, you know what, uh, my husband and I are working from home. We don't go out in public. We mask. We're really strict about it. I would say, you know, I'd probably then think about getting the vaccine, the first dose, in my second trimester, because that risk goes up the, the higher the trimester um, uh, that you are at in terms of getting COVID and having complicated disease. So again, my, my own uh, impression of the vaccine is that it is safe during pregnancy. We have not seen a single indicator of anything that would indicate alarm or risk. There's more to learn, right? I'd like to have data on 20,000 pregnant women, but I don't have that. So I am in the situation of some data about the risk of vaccine and a lot more data about the risk of disease. And so we have to operate together, me and my patient discussing it and figuring out what is best for her and her family. And Greg, I'm not sure how much this weighs into the consideration of the complexity or severity of the disease in women, but I had read somewhere that the risk of long hauler syndrome or having long-term um, fatigue and other uh, complications of COVID uh, might be higher in women. You know, that does seem to be true. That is an impression. We don't yet have good data for that, but I share that impression. We have seen that with other kind of long haul symptoms chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, uh, post-Lyme and other infections. I think that's real. Um, I think it has to do with the difference by gender in immune systems. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. Women generally have much better immune responses to vaccines than men do. But the other side of that coin is that they have a much higher incidence of autoimmune diseases, not due to the vaccine, but just autoimmune diseases in general. And so there, there appears to be something that might put them at slightly greater risk for those long, so-called long haul symptoms, but a lot to be learned there yet. I, I think the main thing is that it is incumbent on us as medical professionals to not only take those symptoms seriously, but to begin to do the research and understand what are the best treatments to help people recover from those symptoms. That's a great answer. Greg, one of the little challenges that we have had that we ask you to help us interpret at times is all of the changing CDC uh, guidelines. Obviously, the guidance has to change as we learn more about the virus and um, its complexities. Um, there is now a recommendation that fully vaccinated people wouldn't need to quarantine. Can you tell me in what situation um, that would be applied? Yeah, and I want to say this clearly because there's an important nuance here that the media kind of misses when they say vaccinated people don't have to be quarantined. Here's the recommendation. Two weeks after your second dose, if you're exposed, you don't need to be quarantined unless you develop symptoms for the next 10 weeks. 
after 12 weeks, 12 weeks after your second dose, you have to quarantine if you get exposed. So it's a brief kind of 10 week time period, two weeks after the second dose up to 12 weeks after the second dose, leaving 10 weeks in there that you wouldn't have to quarantine if you got exposed and had no symptoms. And why is that, Greg? Is that because we don't know how long um, the um, protection lasts? Precisely. So it's, it's, a, it's a careful measure designed to kind of open the door for a little bit of flexibility, but to go slow and phased. And we'll march that time period out longer and longer as we have more and more data, particularly in the face of these variants. These variants are changing what we knew when we weren't dealing with these variants. So it's a very fluid situation. It remains that way, doesn't it? It Just sure does. A challenge. Well, here's another one for you. There's been such debate about what should be done with children and uh, schools. And um, I think every state is facing this. It's now been a year that um, some uh, kids have not been able to be in classrooms. And I know it's concerning to educators and to parents alike. What are the current recommendations uh, from the CDC and practically uh, regarding uh, schools? This is a really tough one. And boy, do I, my heart goes out to those parents with young kids where, where they don't know what to do. I, I think the data are pretty clear that particularly the younger children do better in a classroom setting, or I should say a structured learning environment. Kids who are at risk do better when they're in school. Older kids, high school, maybe even junior high, you have a little more flexibility there. So what CDC is trying to do is sort of thread that needle in, in, in an appropriate way, I think, to say that there are phases and mitigation measures that can be taken. And what they're saying is that if there's low levels of community transmission, and if there is strict adherence to proper masks worn properly and distancing and appropriate contact surface cleaning and the availability of testing and contact tracing. So that's a lot of ifs, a lot of provisos. If you do all of those, you might then consider particularly getting the elementary school kids back in school um, because they do seem to have less in the way of disease, less risk of transmitting than as you get up into the high school years um, and kind of marching it out that way. Now, having said all that, the one remaining boogeyman in all of this is those are data done in the face of the original strain that circulated. When, not if, unfortunately, but when we have widespread circulation of the South African and other strains, and there are a number of them arising in the U.S., those data could change based on the much higher transmissibility of those variants and also increased lethality of those variants. But at least we've got some science to help guide us and begin to do this in communities that can meet those provisos. And it is awfully hard to teach math over, <laughs> oh. over a Zoom camera. So my heart goes out to those parents and educators as well. You know, it's funny you say that. Math and me as a young boy would not, were not a good combination, and I would not have learned as well as I, I did in a classroom setting. I just remember my struggles with algebra with my uh, younger daughter, and whew, I, I don't envy the parents who are, who are no. trying to do that right now. So, <laughs> um, Greg, we've talked so much about preventatives, vaccines, et cetera, and I'm wondering about therapeutics now. We haven't talked in a while about what we are treating COVID with uh, when people contract it. So what, yes. what's out there now? What's the new cocktail? You know, there's a new cocktail, uh, ban levivimab and uh, uh, edisevimab. These are two monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies designed to attack that receptor binding domain of that S protein, preventing it, the, the virus from docking with or joining with the receptor that's on our cells. The net effect of that is the virus can't enter our cells, can't cause infection. 
These are very encouraging data. It was very effective in preventing progression from mild disease or even moderate disease to severe disease. The problem is it requires IV infusion and there are some other provisos around it. You have to be age 12 and older and at least 40 kilograms, but it's really meant, and I, and I like the strategy here, it's, if you will, a, a rescue kind of therapy. And what I mean by that is after exposure with mild to moderate disease, if you are not yet hospitalized, not on oxygen, but at high risk of progressing to that, we now have an option and a good option in terms of doing that. Now, I mentioned that because monoclonals have not been well used in the U.S. And many of us think that the use of monoclonals, the use of high titer convalescent plasma are therapeutic options that are underused and should be used. So Greg, you said for high risk, but not necessarily so ill that they're on oxygen. Is this an outpatient therapy primarily? Yeah, you can, it's, it's, it, yeah it's designed to be infused uh, as an outpatient. These are, these are uh, the monoclonal antibodies are something that we would be very careful about in, in a hospitalized patient or somebody already on oxygen. And the reason for that is we don't have any data of their benefit once the horse is, so to speak, out of the barn. It's really in that early stage that we want, that they are found to be the most effective. So to try to keep people from progressing or from needing hospitalization. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's great. Anything else you'd like to share with us today, Greg? Um, let's see. Uh, you know, when, when I was just thinking when you were saying that about uh, vaccines, that's a, that's a little over 11% of the American population that has already gotten a vaccine. And I, I guess, you know, I'm just, I'm really encouraged to tell you the truth. I now see when I have to go out, I see everybody in a mask. Now, sometimes they're not using it appropriately. And we should mention that CDC has come out with a recommendation that you either wear a surgical mask tightly or, you put a cloth mask on top of that, in essence, what's called double masking. That was found to be over 96% effective in preventing transmission. That's slightly better than vaccines. So wow. this, is, this is highly effective. And what I'm encouraged about is, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel unless this virus comes, comes up with something we're not expecting. It really does work. We have solid data. If you wear a proper mask properly, if you maintain distancing, if you get vaccines, we're going to get back to normal. That's wonderful, Greg. And I have to say, Greg, that when I go out and see people in masks, I am continuously amazed by noses not covered, no. big gaps. It's like they're wearing a mask, but not really wearing a mask. Yeah. So it, I know at Mayo that we have determined that we are all wearing one mask because we're wearing surgical masks. Yes. We're wearing them tightly fitted to our faces. Right. And so it truly makes a difference, I think, how you wear the mask versus yeah. two masks. I see the same thing. The other thing I see, and you know, I'm always very humble when I approach somebody about it, but I'll see the blue um, surgical mask worn inside out with the white side out and the blue side in. It's not meant to be worn that way. The blue side or the yellow side should be out. And it should be, as you're pointing out, tight fitting. There should not be gaps alongside the nose, along the cheek or under the chin. And if your particular mask doesn't fit you that way, you may be able to knot it so that it fits tighter or put a second mask over that to protect yourself. And we've really seen the value. You know, I, I was thinking uh, when we were talking about long haulers, that the, the best defense is to prevent getting infected in the first place. Now, that's not always under our control, right? Healthcare workers, we know when we walk into that room, even with our protective gear, there's still some small chance. But we take that risk on behalf of the public that we serve, right? I mean, our motto at Mayo remains the needs of the patient come first. And so we take those risks. And what we're asking is that all of us 
take the same precautions, all of us together. And uh, I'm just really encouraged. It's working. We're getting the message across and it's working and lives are being saved. Well, Greg, we love to hear you encouraged. Hands, <laughs> face, space, and, and space. vaccinate, right? And vaccination. <laughs> we should and end more every program. More of those way. vaccines are coming. I mean, we're doing, right. we're doing well over a million doses a day in wow. this country. That's just wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Greg, for some encouraging news today. Yes. Well, we appreciate it. Our thanks to our weekly guest, Dr. Greg Poland, who is an infectious disease expert, virologist, and vaccine expert at Mayo Clinic. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. We wish everyone a wonderful day. And be encouraged. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.